This is a story from a, a number of years ago, um, and people have often asked me where the ideas for these stories come from. Uh, and mostly these days, uh, they come from the characters. But in the early days, the stories were brushed with the, uh, the brush of fact. Sometimes I, as many young writers do, uh, use the, the stuff of my own life for the stories. And I'm going to tell you a story from the early days now, an old favorite of mine. And there is a section of this, a, a contained section, which has a beginning, middle, and an end within the structure of the story, which is God's truth, which came right from my life. Uh, your job as you're enjoying the fiction of the story is to see if you can ferret out the fact. <laughs> so it's a story that goes back a number of years, a story that goes back to when uh, Dave's daughter, Stephanie, was still living at home, and back when she was still in high school and Sam, her, her brother, Sam, well, Sam would have still, he would have been in elementary school, I guess. Begins the summer that Margot, Dave's niece Margot, his sister Annie's little girl, that Margot, it starts the summer that Margot came to visit uh, Dave and Morley. At Christmas, the previous Christmas, Annie had written that she was going to France for the summer. Annie played in a Gaelic music group, and Morley said, well, why don't we take Margot and give Annie some time off? Annie wrote back the next day, are you sure? <laughs> Dave wasn't sure. Dave was feeling overwhelmed. We already have one little girl that I don't understand, he said to Morley. Margot nevertheless arrived July 1st, flew in from Halifax by herself. You wouldn't let me fly to Halifax alone, said Stephanie, as she and Dave drove to the airport to pick Margot up. Margot, who was 10 that summer, arrived all sullen and grumpy. She wanted to come to Paris, said Annie to Morley on the phone. I'm, I'm sorry, will, will you guys be all right? Well, we'll be fine, said Morley, not knowing that at that very moment, Dave was standing by a luggage carousel at the airport trying to coax his niece to tell him the color of her suitcase. <laughs> Is it that one, he said? I don't know, said Marco. How about that one, said Dave? I told you, I don't know. Eventually, they made it back to the car with her suitcase, where Stephanie was waiting. Stephanie was pretty grumpy herself. Stephanie had refused to go into the airport and was lying in the back seat when Margot and Dave returned. She was wearing headphones, her eyes closed, her feet tapping on the passenger door window. She didn't acknowledge their arrival until Dave reached into the back seat and removed her headphones. Hey, she said. Ten-year-old Margot watching all this go down very carefully. <laughs> Stephanie, who was six years her senior, was the most interesting thing to have entered Margot's universe for some time. Stephanie was a gateway into the world of teenage femininity. As soon as she saw her, Margot knew she wanted as much time with Stephanie as she could get. She was attentive to everything that Stephanie did, the music she played, the way she used the phone, and what she watched on television. When she learned that Stephanie and Sam were about to leave for two weeks at camp, Margot was distraught. What about me, she said. What about Margot, said Dave that night. Dave was holding out a camping association booklet. They were sending the other two kids away. Why wouldn't they send her too? <laughs> Morley glanced at the booklet and shrugged. She's your niece, she said. So Dave sat down and began flipping through the brochure. He didn't usually handle jobs like this. He'd only spent one summer at camp himself. He was hired as the arts and crafts director. Before he left for camp, he was seized by a primitive and unfamiliar wilderness spasm. Bought a book on plant identification, which had pencil sketches in the margins of flowers and trees and shrubs. He was enthralled with it, had the idea that he would spend his free time poking around in the forest, 
believing that if he applied himself, that by the end of the summer, he could become an accomplished woodsman. Maybe by August, some kid hanging around the hike and trip office would poke his buddy as Dave swung by and say, that's, that's Dave there. The kid would say it with the same reverence. He might say, that's Pierre Radisson. <laughs> Dave planned to forego the pleasures of the Red Pine Inn where the other counselors went to drink at night and get up in the morning with the sun and go to bed at dark. Born to television, bred to the automobile, he would become wilderness, Dave. <laughs> As arts and crafts director, Dave had a two-room cabin called the Wigwam. The Wigwam was near the hospital. And he set off from his cabin at rest period on his second day at camp with his plant book in his back pocket. Somewhere between the chapel and the rock where the trail angled up toward the council ring, Dave found himself staring at a shrub with thin, striped leaves. It looked like the first picture in his book. It was an Indian turnip. Now, the way you identify Indian turnip, said the book, was by its white root. Dave reached out and plucked the plant from the ground. <laughs> to his great astonishment, he was holding something that looked like a white carrot. He still finds it difficult to understand what happened next. <laughs> Probably it was the word turnip that led him astray. <laughs> uh, perhaps he was just excited. Whatever the case, Dave wiped the root on his jeans, brought it up to his mouth, and took a bite. <laughs> he had already swallowed a mouthful before it occurred to him that this might not have been the smartest thing he had ever done. <laughs> and that's when things started to happen in the back of his throat. First thing was a mild burning sensation. The second felt more like a small nuclear device had been detonated in the vicinity of his tonsils. As he stood there on the chapel trail, clutching the stump of the Indian turnip, wondering what would happen next, he noticed that his lips had gone numb. In fact, his entire mouth had begun to tingle, and the tingling was crawling down his esophagus towards his stomach. Turnip in hand, Dave headed back to camp. If he was going to lapse into unconsciousness, he wanted to do it where someone might be there to help him. But once back at camp and still vertical, he felt too foolish to turn himself in to the nurse. How could he go to the nurse and tell her he had pulled some unknown thing out of the ground and taken a bite? <laughs> and so I went back to my cabin and I lay down on my bed. I, he, Dave went back to his cabin. <laughs> That settles that. <laughs> well, we're all friends. <laughs> or were. He went back to his cabin and lay down on his bed. And it occurred to him that if he slipped into unconsciousness, no one would know why. He got up, and he put the turnip on his desk. And then he wrote a note and placed it beside the turnip. The note said, I ate some of this. He drew an arrow pointing at the turnip. Dave figured if he made it to dinner, he could destroy the note, and no one would ever know anything. If he blacked out, on the other hand, someone would eventually find him, read the note, and organize the appropriate treatment. Dave lay down and prepared to die. <laughs> After an hour of prayer and wild promise to, to weld to pretty much every god that has ever claimed holiness, it occurred to Dave to have another look at his plant book. In his enthusiasm, Dave had failed to turn to page two. He turned the page 
and read the rest of the story. Indian turnip, he read, a close relation of the horseradish. When cooked, it is a mild and pleasant vegetable. When eaten raw, it's the hottest plant known in the North Woods. The First Nations used to feed it to early settlers whenever they wanted a giggle. Painful, but not poisonous. And this is where we move back to the world of fiction. <laughs> that night Dave got drunk at the... Ra- okay, perhaps not right away. <laughs> but soon. That night Dave got drunk at the Red Pine Inn. Next day he gave the plant book away to the hike and trip director. That night, after the kids were in bed, Dave came downstairs with the camping booklet. There are camps with rifle ranges, he said. We're not sending Margo somewhere where they arm the campers. I knew you could handle this, said Morley. Dave chose a camp that didn't have power boats. No water skiing, he said to Margo, no horses either. A small, quiet camp with a lake and sailboats, a, a summer place. What Margo really wanted, of course, was to go to a camp with Stephanie. But Stephanie was going to a teenage camp, and for the first time ever, to a camp with boys. They all left the next Monday morning, a morning that was as chaotic as Christmas. Sam packed comic books and no clothes. (laughs) Stephanie thumped downstairs with a trunk and a suitcase and a sports bag full of stuff. She wasn't talking to anybody mad about something, nervous, if truth be told. Dave looked at her across the breakfast table, scowling into her cereal bowl, and his heart went out to the boys into whose life his daughter was about to march. (laughs) Somewhere, he thought, some poor kid is calmly eating breakfast with no idea what's heading his way. (laughs) Margot was the last to leave. Dave drove her to the parking lot of a suburban shopping center after lunch. She was wearing blue shorts, a white t-shirt, and a scarf in her hair. Last Dave saw of her, she was on a bus with a lot of other kids, Margo sitting alone at the back of the bus, all the other kids clapping their hands and singing. Margo, she had her hands in her lap and was staring dead ahead. For the first few days the kids were gone, Dave was edgy. I don't get it, he said. You're worried about them, said Morley. Margot's the one I'm worried about, said Dave. In the morning he'd wake up, say, I wonder how she's doing. Morley would say, "She's, she's doing fine. And pathetically, that would make everything okay, make Dave feel better. But it never lasted. An hour later, he'd be all fretting again. First letter arrived at the beginning of their second week away. Dear Uncle Dave, this place is torture. Get me out of here. The meals are horrible. I haven't eaten anything for two days. They serve old porridge in the morning. My counselor's name is Phyllis. She looks like Igor. (laughs) I got bit by some weird-looking bug, and my arm is swelling up and turning red. Love and kisses your niece, Margot. (laughs) Dave was horrified. She's fine, said Morley. Dave said she's starving. What if she gets so hungry she goes into the woods and pulls a poisonous plant out of the ground and eats it? (laughs) Morley, who was already in bed, didn't even pretend to stop reading. Dave, she said, only an idiot would go into the woods and pull up a plant and eat it. (laughs) No one's that stupid. (laughs) On Monday, Dave came home at lunch and saw an envelope addressed in Stephanie's handwriting. Dave's heart was filled with the milk of human kindness when he saw it. Kids had been gone 12 days now. 
And he was worried about Margot, but he missed Stephanie. So he carried that envelope over to the kitchen table and sat down and held it up and put it down. And then he got up and walked across the kitchen and opened the fridge, poured himself some juice. He was savoring the moment. Delayed pleasure. Dave was old enough to know that sometimes anticipation is as good as anything gets. And so he sat there for a while anticipating the letter. And then he opened it. There are boys everywhere, it began. <laughs> boys, 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 this camp is boy heaven. Mostly they're pretty lame. Except there's this guy, Larry, who was 18 and a lifeguard and a hunk, and last night, last night, last night, Dave stopped reading and stared out the kitchen window. <laughs> the latter seemed to be heading to a place he didn't want to go. He didn't want to know about last night. Glanced down at the pages on the table in front of him, and then he began to read again from the very beginning, July the 7th, Dear Becky. <laughs> Becky is Stephanie's best friend. Dave stared at the greeting of that letter as the awful truth came slowly into focus. His daughter had put the letter that she had written to her friend Becky into the envelope she had addressed to her parents. It was seven pages long. I don't need to read this, thought Dave. This letter was not meant for me. Please, Lord, give me the strength not to read this letter. <laughs> Lead me not into temptation. Stop me from reading any further. Deliver me from evil. <laughs> and his eyes flicked down at the page in front of him, and he thought he saw the word tongue. <laughs> and he looked away quickly. Lord, he said, why are you testing me like this? <laughs> it has been Dave's experience during a long and confusing life. But the best way to get rid of a temptation is to give in to it. <laughs> and he sat there at the table fidgeting with the letter. And then, without looking at it, he thought of his little girl as sweet as summer. And then, not sure at all that he was doing the right thing, he folded it and put it back in the envelope. And he got up from the table and he carried it across the kitchen the way he might have carried a dead mouse, <laughs> holding it out away from his body. And he dropped it in the garbage can below the sink. And he never mentioned it again, ever. Not to his wife when she came home that night. Not to his daughter when she came home from camp. And not to his daughter's friend Becky when she came visiting at summer's end. Only sure of one thing. If he was doing the right thing, he was doing it for the wrong reason. He was acting out of cowardice, not courage. He fretted all night. He phoned Margot's camp the next morning. A woman answered the phone. Dave said, I'm phoning about my niece. I was wondering how she's doing. She's in Igor's tent. <laughs> The lady at the other end of the phone said, who? <laughs> Dave hung up. <laughs> On Wednesday, he couldn't stand it any longer. I I'm going to drive up to see her, he said. Margot's camp was a two-hour drive north. Parked his car in the visitor's parking lot at the camp gate. There were no other cars there. And he started off down the dirt road toward camp. It was a lake beside the road on his left, a forest on his right. It was a beautiful summer afternoon. The sky blue, the clouds white and blowy, warm wind off the lake. The city was so hot, so sticky. It wasn't hot here. He could hear children playing ahead of him around the bend in the road. He couldn't see them, but he could hear them. And then when he came to the bend, he saw a beach and 
a group of kids swimming. From where he was, he could see down the length of the lake, shadows of the clouds on the water. It was beautiful, more beautiful than he'd imagined. And he stood there, and he drank it all in. He was about to walk down to the beach when he recognized one of the bathing suits. It was Margot. Margot standing at the dock end of the diving board. Margot laughing and pointing at a kid in the water. Margot running the length of the board and hurling herself into space, grabbing her feet and tucking. Cannonball. They've stepped off the road so no one would see him. And he stood there among the trees and watched his niece playing. Watched her get out of the lake all legs and arms, tighten herself into a towel and pick her barefoot way along the same road that he was standing beside. And he felt foolish. Morley was right, again. <laughs> Margot was fine. She was better than fine. And that was good enough for Dave. He was fine, too. He headed back to the car. His family was growing up. And like always, there were a few steps ahead of him.